Now, I am just going to actually just give um, my reflections on Professor Wangari Malai and just contextualize it in terms of the Wangari Malai Institute. And I have just this first slide here of her smiling, just uh, with that quote from her, that when we plant trees, we plant the seeds of peace and hope. And I remember many times when I went to read as director of Angari Madai tree planting, I always emphasize on this, that the trees, when you plant them, then the birds are able to push there, build their nests, uh, breed in that place of safety. And therefore there is hope of a new generation coming in. And even under that tree, there are the insects and the other life forms that continue to enjoy uh, the, the, that tree that you plant. And therefore you plant the seeds of peace and hope. Now, as I share on my reflections of Professor Angari Madai, what comes to mind was her, 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 her ability to see the outcome of whatever she chose to do. To have an image of what is it that she want to do. She had developed that very, very deeply. Many of you who write projects, uh, especially development projects, I know Professor Homer does many of these, and Professor Karaja and Ika, as well as others who are here. Uh, the development project, they always want to know what is the outcome of what is it, of this project that you want to do. And uh, that is actually, in my view, as I reflect on her, the, where she had developed the most yeah, to see the outcome. And, uh, and uh, because she could see the outcome, she was able, therefore, to, to get other people to work with her and even to risk with her, Be particularly because she was also able not only to see, but also to share that image with others. She worked and spent time with others to be able to, to share that image with her, to be able to see it. And some of you who are involved either in, in a Huru Park or in the Karura or in the release of the political prison, the prisoners, you know how, uh, or even uh, protecting public spaces, you know how many of those people she worked with could even risk their own lives on the release of the political prison. Yes, they could risk their own lives. And they risk their own lives because they, she had managed to share that final image, that outcome with them. And nothing would stand between them and getting that. Um, like the, the, the women she worked with in, uh, in uh, releasing, having their sons released from detention. The women could see their sons enjoying freedom like other Kenyans. And they were ready to face the police, even with the bullets. And the, and the buttons, police beating them up. And some of, some, in some cases, they even um, remove their clothes to, to just show their disgust with what the police were doing because the police were coming to stop them from that outcome, from that image, from that resource, which was so clear to them that their sons are going to be priests, released and that they are going to walk with their sons in freedom. She was excellent in that. Seeing the outcome, seeing the image, and being able to share that with anyone. I spent many hours with her. She called me uh, for meetings in her house, 
uh, outside in her office to discuss and so that she can share that outcome, that image of the Wangari Madai Institute with, with, with me. And as a result, it was now therefore not very difficult, even as she left us so abruptly that I was able now to carry forward and to ensure that the Institute was realized. Because I had also seen the image of that Institute. I had seen the students working there. I had seen the faculty. I had seen others experiencing the Institute and going out there to serve and to become the seeds of hope and peace. That was her gift. As we reflect on her, on, 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 on Professor Wangari Madai, the ability to see the outcome, the ability to see the end, the ability to share that image, and therefore to get all other people converted and to work with her for that. As I was trying to, to think about this matter, what was the root of her being able to develop that uh, ability to see the head? And I go back to uh, when she, she did her project back in, uh, Pit, in the University of Pittsburgh in the United States of America, where she did her master's. At that time, she was known by other students as well as the, her faculty as Miss Wangari Mary Josephine Muta. Very fancy name, two English names, Mary Josephine. I think later uh, she has written in her book, she dropped some because some people now will drop the names and they begin to call her Miss Wangari or Mrs. Wangari. And she dropped uh, like that and they, and they started calling now uh, Wangari Muta. But, and, and, and she wrote her thesis, her MSc thesis in Pittsburgh. I just got this reference in, in Google. And you see it is written Muta WMJ. Uh, and she did her work on development of, of uh, development and cytological study of the pineal body of the Kutunix quail in 1965. And I've given the image of the quail there. The pineal body is an organ you find in the brain, at the floor of the brain. And you find it in, uh, in, uh, in many animals, at least in all vertebrates. And it helps us to define the cacadian the Cacadian living. That is to be able to know day and night so that if you haven't slept for so long, it releases some, some hormones called the melatonin. And they tell the body that the body now is fatigued, it's tired, it needs to rest. So it is our body clock. And she did her work then on the development of this organ. The thing with the development, when you are studying development, uh, you have the organ in the past, you have looked at it, and you want to go back to know how it came about. So she began there, you have the image, you have the structure, you have even the function of a fully formed pineal body. But now she wanted to know where did it come from? And as we reflect on, on, on her, I find that that is one of the roots of her developing this skill of being able to know the outcome. She began by, she has the outcome, the pineal body, fully formed pineal body and its function, and now decided to unlevel it slowly to the cellular level, to the cell level and find out how did it come to be, to be organized the way it is. After she finished her, her, her master's in Pittsburgh, she came to the University of Nairobi. And where she was uh, employed at the Department of Fate Anatomy. At that time, she decided to do a project 
And initially, she wanted to do a project again, still on the pineal body. But when she went to, to Munich in Germany, and with the discussion and prodding of Professor Peter Water, she found that this may not give her enough data to write a PhD thesis. And again, she, she changed her subject and again went to back to another organ now, still on development. And she now worked on the early stages of a, of a bionic development of the bovine gonad. And I put the image of the gonad there, the testes of the bull. She, in her mind, she says, now I still need to do development, but what do I work on? And together with water, they said, let us work on the development of the testes. Again, fine tuning her skill on development. She says, now, you know how the testes look like. But how does it come about? How does it come to be the way it is? How does it come to be placed where it is placed? How does it come? It is organized like that. We have various uh, structures there, like we call the, sem the seminiferous tibules. How do they come to be? How, do the, 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 how are the sperms formed? And, the, and at what point are they released? So, but again, she is starting with what we know to coming from how does it come to be? And again, she is on the subject of development, thinking about change, change. To be that optimal structure, that optimal organ, that optimal body that does work the way it does it. Yeah. How do all the things come into play to ensure that that organ, like we can think of an organism like University of Nairobi or like a whole cow, how does it come to be to work the way it does? And there are various pieces that come to play. Even as you, as a human being, when you walk, you run, there are so many parts of the body that are involved. How did those parts of the body come in the place the way they are and to be well synchronized to perform the function that they do. So, and, and that is an important subject, even as we think about the development and because later she began to talk about the concepts of sustainable development. And they began to talk about for sustainable development, you need good governance, you need peace, you need to take care of the environment. But she is again talking about development. Yeah. Because she had learned from that early, from that early development, intellectual development of her brain that the, the concept of development is important. And the first thing is that you have to see the, the final image. And, the, and in, in this later concept, when she got the no, Nobel Peace Prize, what she came up with is now, how do we get good, how do we get sustainable development? To get it, you need good governance, you need good care of the environment, and you need peace. Again, for purpose of development, the pieces you need to ensure that development takes place. And that's why I say again, she, she had to see the, to have the testes perform the way it does, what are the pieces that come to place and at what point so that it functions the way it functions in the production. So as we reflect about her, this is what my, as I reflect about, that's what I think about her. As she, she started thinking about very complex things that the world now recognize her, that that is where she began in terms of thinking about the development of the pineal body and the development of the bovine testes the gonads and the, or, or at, in stage five and 110 millimeter of what we call the, 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 the CRL or crowd lamp length. I had mentioned this, that uh, she was hired on, on, on 1st of February, 1966. 
in the University College of Nairobi, University of East Africa. At that time, the, the chairman of the Department of Anatomy and Histology, Department of Anatomy and Histology, was Professor Leinhard Hoffman, uh, who was the chairman of the department at the University of Nairobi. He's the one who hired her and also uh, mentored her uh, through her PhD, even as when she went to Munich and when she came back. Uh, and later on, she took over uh, as chairman of the department years later. Now, again, when now she has left now the structure, the development of the structure, of the body structure, and she started thinking about other developments now, particularly on how to ensure that, uh, that, that, that the community, the women, the people, are developed, they change to a better status. And in this now is where she thought about what does she do? And it is when she came up with the concept of the Green Belt Movement, which is started in 1977. And you see the Green Belt Movement is, is a grassroots non-governmental environment organization that focuses on environmental conservation and development. And she does not leave the issue of development because that is her foundation in the university. How can she now ensure that the knowledge she has learned on how structure, the body structure functions optimally? How is the body structure has developed to function optimally? How now can she bring this knowledge to the social arena to ensure that the community the people develop and that they are, they are optimized and that they meet their objectives and they are happy. The most members of this group are women. And she, at, at that time, uh, started with this slogan to build them because she needed them to see the image. Like what I started to see before. Because with the concept of development, you, you need to have the organ that is performing optimally. But now when you come to the society for development, society, the people are not able to see the image of what they will become tomorrow. And you need to walk them. With the testes, you can, you can show it. With the pony opinion your body, you can dissect it and show it. But how do you show a developed society without, and, 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 and it, is, it is as a society in Teto, it is that society in Muranga, it's a society in Kenya. How do the people in Madare or in any other place see that development before it has come to be? So she had to galvanize women, she had to galvanize them. And uh, initially calling it, it is save the lad Harabe. So that's how finally she initially recorded it, save the land Harabe, so that at least they see what they are doing is to save the land. At least they can see that one in the first instance. And, and then they were made to commit to this statement that being aware that Kenya is being threatened by expansion of desert-like conditions that desertification comes as a result of misuse of the land and by consequent soil erosion, and that these actions result in rot, malnutrition, famine, and death will resolve to save our land. They resolve to save the land, at least the land they can see. So, now, the thing is now to go back and see what are the activities they need to do to save the land that they can see. And to, so that she can begin them there in the concept or in this concept of development. And she, she, she has explained this in uh, the book she wrote, uh, Jeep Greenberg Movement, sharing the approach and the experience that losing topsoil 
should be considered as analogous to losing territory to an invading army. And indeed, if a country was so threatened, it would mobilize all available resources to protect this priceless commodity. And she again and now brought the, the army and the schools. And this uh, initially the army was a bit reluctant. It's when she became the, the assistant minister for environment, is when she managed to bring the army. And the army proceeded to do a lot of tree planting. I recall that one time she was at Karula, where she convened the military who had done good things in planting trees and awarded them. I, I, I recently, one of them showed me a certificate they received during this time. And that is important to ensure that people are able to see after they develop, what is it? What, what is that image? What, what, are, what is going to happen? How, is the, how will the community have changed? And this, you have to bring all the people together, everybody to contribute in their own way. The school going children, the military, the working communities to plant the trees, not for you to enjoy the shade immediately, but for the future generation. Because when you are talking about development, we're talking about change. And you have to contribute, the little you contribute when the organs are developing, like when we talked about the testes. You see one cell move in, a blood vessel come in to feed this, nutrients are brought in, another cell of another type come in. And finally, you have the full testes that produces the sperms. Now, the issue of this plays different roles. This military, this, the school children, the women, Everybody plays a role, and finally you see the forest. The people, only thing she brought to them is that this activity that you do will help to save the land. Just put that in your mind, it will help to save the land. But finally, you will be able to see if you drive to some parts of this country, you see they are forested now. You see uh, the area of Somulanga and the other areas with a lot of trees. But the concept you tell them to, you want to save the land. People will be able to get firewood. People are able to get wood to plant, to, to build houses for their sons. But the simple message he gave them is let us save our land. And through this, she taught them how to plant appropriately species how to maintain vegetation cover. And as I say, the green belt was initially just to create weed breaks, the green belts to create weed breaks by digging terraces, protecting forests and catchment areas for discriminate exploitation. And in order to pass this outcome, to the communities, she did a lot of training because it's again connected to Angari Mada Institute. Because it is where she starts now thinking that how can this come to the university to ensure that those who come to the university, the professors, the policy makers, the students, the visitors who come there are trained, are converted to protect the land. So she did a lot of training. And one concept she kept on using for the training is uh, what she was calling kujijua. You need to know yourself. Because when you know yourself, then you know why you are where you are. And she would give the concept of the wrong bus syndrome. You find yourself entering a bus, takes you to Nakuru, but you wanted to go to Mashakos. How did you get to Nakuru? You need to reflect on this. And again, you have to unwind. In the same concept I said, she was working on the pineal body and the testes. You have to see how did that come to be the testes? How did that come to be the pineal body? How did you find yourself in Nakuru and not in Mashakos? You have to 
Now, and why that to find out where the, the mistake take place so that you correct it and you correct it and you, you get the outcome of the pineal body that is able to, collect, to control the cacadian rhythm. That you come out, the person who is changed and the better and the developed and the able to address your problems. Don't blame the chief, don't blame the government, don't blame this. How do you, how do you unpackage where you find yourself? You find yourself in a certain status. How do you break this up to find out exactly how did you come to that? So that she trained people, given the concept that she had learned on development, how, how can you at any one time be reflecting about your abilities and how to exploit your abilities? And therefore, why you are in the status you are now and why it is not different? Why are you where you are now? Is it that possible that you could be elsewhere? And if you could be elsewhere, where did you go wrong? What is it that we can do? And in her book, Challenges for Africa, which is again a book about development in Africa. And it is mainly about the, the trying to reflect why is Africa the way it is now? Could we have been a better place? So she has written that book and she has elaborated various examples. And one of the examples she gives in when she had gone for a meeting in Yaoundé in Cameroon. And she says in that meeting, she was looking through the window and she could see some women working on a hillside. And she thought to herself, those two people should not be working on such a steep hill because they are very quickly going to lose all that soil when it rains. And she was saying, when we do our work in high level meetings, we are not making changes where they really matter. In this case, in the world where that farmer, the farmer of Yaoundé, places her blade in the soil. Because the farmer at that time, she, what she described in her book, is that, that the farmer used to build some small terraces, learning top down. And then they, they, they would, the farmer in the order would plant the seeds now in between the terraces, in between those tunnels, ladder that she was building, in between the small tunnels. The problem is that those tunnels, when the lane is heavy, they will become the channels of running water. And as water accumulates, they will build gardens and they will carry with them the soil. And once the soil goes, we have lost the land. She argues, how did we find ourselves there? Why are we not developed? In her book, if you, you can read it, it's called Challenges for Africa by Wangari Madai. And, and this issue of development and the issue of finding out where we are now, as you reflect on this, she began to think about how can the universities, how can the universities contribute to changing the status of where we find ourselves today. And she began exploring, she had been out of the university for many years. She left in 81 initially to go and contest as a member of parliament. And she put a lot of her time on the Greenman movement. But now she wanted to come back to the university. She was finding out how does she come back to the university. I'm told that initially she, and Professor Karaja has, she can confirm this, she shared with Kara, Professor Karaja and asked Karaja, can you try to find out how we can get back to the university, to work in the, in the university, to have the university come and help our people to save our land. And they initially approached uh, the UNES then, the University uh, of Nairobi Enterprises, and the University of Nairobi Enterprises then was engrossed in, uh, in, in the module, learning module two programs. 
and then he was asking about how does this thing make money? And uh, Professor Karaja, I think at the time, I don't know whether he, 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 he was not able, at least he made the efforts, but the UNES could not see the connection. They were thinking of how, how, how to make money. They were not in that thing of how do you save our land. And then uh, through all this, we, we later had a, had a, I had a meeting with her. At that time, Professor Peter Gear, who was mentioned earlier by Professor Nikal, visited the country. We went with him to Masai Mara, where we were, where we were giving a joint paper with Professor Peter Gear, uh, Professor John Minor, and the other scholars in a big meeting that was organized there. And the meeting was dubbed from molecules to migration. And because in Masai Mara, you know, there is uh, the, the animals there that does a lot of, there are many of them, they migrate in, the, in, the, in different seasons. And we were thinking about how do you start from the molecule to migration? Again, to do with the issue of development, the stages to develop to that level of migration. And we were presenting a paper on the biology of the DDX cells, how the DDX cells contribute to immunity. So after the meeting, Professor Gea then said, okay, we need uh, to have a meeting with Professor Wangale Madai. And I organized that meeting. And I organized that meeting. Uh, initially, she had offered us to go to her house but later she said, why don't we meet in a hotel? And we, made, we met in the Mayafi Hotel uh, in Upper Hill. And we had a very good discussion uh, over a cup of coffee and, and some juice, you can see, some coffee there and some juice, we enjoyed it. And we shared, they shared quite some good experiences with Peter Gear, Because Peter Gear, when he was doing his uh, doctorate degree, he had, being recommended by his mentor, he was viable to come to the University of Nairobi, where Wangari then was the chairman of the department, and Wangari helped him to access a lot of mammals uh, from um, Nairobi National Park, then to study the lungs, how the lungs function. So they did very good work and they published a lot of papers with the word Bible on this matter. And so, and then Professor Gia kept contact with Wangari since that time because of those foundations that Wangari gave him. Uh, at the very end, end of the meeting, and you can see now it is dark, the background there. At the end of the meeting, then we, I, I asked Professor Wangari, I would like you to come back to the university to mentor the young people. And she, it is at the same time she told me that she has been thinking about this matter of how to come back to the university. She had made the efforts and that it would be appropriate for us to organize a formal meeting where we can discuss and agree on what cause or what activities, what action we could take for her to come back to the university. And then we organize a meeting to have next meeting at the Jakarta Hotel in a week's time when we now explored this idea further of forming the Institute. And from the Jakarta meeting, we, it was very clear that she needed to share her idea or her conceptualization of what the issue would look like. Remember from, my, from the beginning, when I was starting to talk about her, the reflections of Professor Agarimada, I said she was very good in sharing the outcome. So she took us for a retreat in Eoselmia. And you see the team that was there in, in, that, in that meeting. And she shared with us what the issue, what she would like to see. And we again now 
worked through to develop a paper, a proposal of that institute. And by the time we left the, the Elsevier in Naivasha, we had a document. Professor Karaja was the, was the main facilitator of this meeting. By the time we came back uh, to, to Nairobi, we had a paper to present to the vice chancellor then Professor uh, George Magoha. And then I also shared the same with the DVC administration and finance then Professor Peter Bitti. Professor Magoha, uh, after a short time, was able to allocate as land uh, 50 acres to put up the institute, where the institute is found now. Uh, initially, we were allocated a piece of land elsewhere, and later, we were allocated at where the institute is established. A, a quick overview of, the, of how the institute has developed. 2009, the institute was approved by Senate. In December, uh, uh, or in the, in, the, in, the, in the same year, uh, year, the institute was approved by council. In uh, January of 2010, the director of the institute was appointed. In February 2010, Wangari Madai was appointed as the distinguished chair of the institute. And in March 2010, we held the first inaugural meeting. Now, when we were thinking about the institute, we came up with various names. And I can quickly learn over this. First, like when we had the meeting in Jakarana, the concept paper that Professor Karaja presented then, it was Wangari Madai Empowerment Center. Leadership training for sustainable development. But then, after our discussion in Ivasha, we changed it to Wangari Madai Institute for Community Empowerment and the Leadership, WAMISEL. And then, with the further discussion, we said that is too long. Then we called it Wangari Madai Institute, WAMI. And if some of you recall, we called it WAMI for quite a while. And then Professor Angari Malai said, no, 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 no. She has been working with the Japanese and many, she has visited many other countries. If you call something like this, it may turn out to be something. It may turn out to be something people like, or it may turn out to be something people do not like, WAMI, the name WAMI. We, if, without finding out whether there are other communities which have a meaning for the name WAMI, we cannot call it WAMI. And we dropped WAMI, we started calling it WMI. I think there are still some people who interacted with us at the beginning who perhaps you say call it WAMI. But WAMI, we were cautioned by her. Because again, of seeing that picture, which other people are not able to see, she is able to see the final picture. It is in the Senate, when the institute was being approved in Senate, that the Senate recommended that having only WMI or Wangari Madai Institute would not be adequate because Wangari Madai was known for her work on peace and environment. And it will therefore be important to include those. And we therefore, the Senate therefore uh, approved that the name be, uh, be Wangari Madai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, which we abbreviate as WMI. The first board meeting, that is the team that came. And again, she was able to share her vision with the team. And we held quite good discussion on 9th of March 2010 on the inaugural board meeting. And you see there, uh, Professor Karaja, uh, we had uh, our administrator, Judy Wabogo, is the one who is just next to Professor Karaja. Then there is this gentleman there, he had been sent to represent uh, Wangari, or to represent the Institute of, of uh, IDS. Institute of Development Studies. Then we had Professor Jenga Munene, who was the Dean of the Faculty of, uh, of Veteran Medicine. Then Professor Kenodia, uh, who was the Dean, Acting Dean, Faculty of Agriculture. And then Professor uh, Delito, 
Professor Delito then had taken over as the dean of uh, faculty of agriculture. But Professor Kinodia, we had been working with him when he was acting dean. So we, we still had, were inviting him for our meetings. And then uh, the late Ben Wawero, uh, who worked with us very, very closely as the academic registrar, as you, you may probably recall, uh, Ben passed on uh, last year. And he had worked very, very hard uh, with the Institute. Uh, he, he never failed to come for any of our meetings. During this uh, meeting, I recall that Professor Wangari asked us to sing this song. Again, because this is a dream, this is a vision which has come to reality. Her, she had seen this image earlier. She had seen it coming, but she needed everybody else to walk with her to that level. And now she, it was a celebration for her. She was celebrating, reaching there. And she therefore called on, on all of us to sing this song, the amazing, Amazing grace. Answers. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. It was grace that brought us thus far. And grace will lead us home. And grace will lead us home. It was clear to her. She had seen that image of the Institute at that time. And now it has come to be holding that first board meeting. She had walked aloud in the college to see where we can cite uh, the institute. You can see some of the people who, who would work with us during this time. And the Professor Karaja was always there. Now, the institute has been and is in place. And the, many of you perhaps have visited and have seen the beautiful buildings, which it took a long time to walk us through to share with the various teams that were designing, to show them the image, to share the image of that institute, how it should look like, and what outcome it should have. And the outcome is shown in this table of the tree that it should be an institute where a lot of research is taking place and causing impact in the society. 
and she would an issue which we would cause policy influence. She was very clear that that is the outcome. It should have global networks. It should have social engagement and outreach. It should offer experiential learning. That is the outcome. As I said, she was very good in seeing the end. And therefore now you begin to do your activities to reach there. And I hope that all those who continue to contribute to the Institute continue to see it in this light, that whatever activity you do, it should lead to policy influence. It should lead to social engagement and outreach. It should lead to more global network because the global network will lead to hybridization. It will lead to multidisciplinary and holistic approach and a new knowledge will be developed. Remember the concept of development that communities will be changed. Communities will be empowered. Communities will be liberated. There will be peace, there will be hope for our people. And she has mentioned this in her book, Replenishing the Earth, spiritual, value, spiritual Values of Healing the Earth, that one aspect of the love of nature that we need to foster is experiential. Nature, and in particular, the world feeds our spirit, and a direct encounter with it is vital in helping us appreciate and care for it. For unless we see it, smell it or touch it, we tend to forget it and our souls with her. She hoped that the Institute will be an opportunity where you see nature, smell it, smell the flowers there, touch and see and feel the environment so that our souls will be rejuvenated, we will not wither, so that we can be able to protect the nature and therefore we save the land. In the strategic plan, we also put, uh, put this one, an inspiring, living, innovative, and creating laboratory, creative laboratory where new green technologies and the best practices of environmental sustainability and conflict resolution can be fostered, developed, tested, validated, and demonstrated. That is the image of the Institute. That is the final outcome of what it should be doing. Professor Wangari Madai, even as we reflect on her, even as I give my reflection on her, she was a scholar. She was a scholar. She wrote books, went for many meetings where she pre made uh, presentations, scholarly presentations. She wrote her book, Grimmer Movement, sharing the approach and the experience. And I have given a few of the quotes from that book. She wrote the book, The Challenges for Africa, which is about development. Why are we where we are now? And she wrote her book on Wangari Madai and Bold, where she has given her own life story. And the last book she wrote, and many of you should read, because that, that book she has written many paragraphs on how she sees the outcome, how she sees the institute, how it will look like in the past. She talking about even her daughter Ruth, how she would like her daughter Ruth to come there and the experience. It is titled The Spiritual Values of Healing Ourselves and the World, Replenishing the Earth. Wangari Madai was actually overall in the issue of development she developed a party, uh, which was called the Masingira Party. And they even got one of the members of parliament, Silas Murioki. Yeah. And beside the Green Bay Movement, she was part of the, uh, the, the NAC coalition government. And she has developed other things. Yeah. In this was our last meeting, at least for conceptualizing the Institute. Not, the, not conceptualizing the, the drawings, because the drawing of the institute we continued beyond here. This was a meeting in Naivasha. You see Professor Karaja there. And he has just, you can see his heart is uh, seal soiled. He has just helped in planting that tree that Wangari planted there. And 
we had gone there for a retreat to finalize the strategic plan of how the mission, the vision of how the institute will look like. And we worked until very late, past midnight. And it is after this meeting, the following day, when everybody had left Naivasha, and we were just with her before I drove her back to Nairobi, that she shared with me that she wasn't well. And soon after, she visited the hospital, then was, ad was admitted in Nairobi Hospital. After that, uh, she was uh, referred to better specialized treatment and went to New York for treatment. And then a year later, because this was August, a year later in November, she passed on. But at this time, all the people who are there were able to get the complete image of the issue because the next time she was coming back was, was February of the following year, 2011, because this was 2010. And by that time she had gone through treatment and she was in and out of hospital until she passed on. But during that time from February to November, she spent again a lot of time with us, particularly to conceptualize the designs of the Institute to ensure that we can see the image so that we are able to put the pieces together of the Institute. I don't know whether we are able to play any music. No, if not, so, uh, we, we, I, I thought we can play that, but that's, that's fine. I think I'm coming to the end now of the presentation. So well, as we reflect on Wangari, and you remember she has also given the story of saving a forest where she is talking about, where she is talking about the birds and the animals which could not come and help the hummingbird, the hummingbird to save the forest. Her, the, the, her contribution to this story is to say, are you, can we see a forest which is not, is not on fire? A forest that is saved. What activities do we need to do? Everybody need to do the little, the little they can do to ensure that the forest is saved. And that is it with development. Remember I started, as I reflected on her, on her study of the pineal body, the study of the testes, where you start cell by cell before you get the pineal body, drop by drop to save the forest. That is my reflection on Wangari Madai. Let us all contribute the little we can to ensure we have sustainable development. Let's see Wangari Madai issue to continue to contribute all the scholars that come there to ensure that there is sustainable development in our land, in Africa, and the rest of the world. Asante sana.